Hello, welcome back to Miss Sogram's Maths. We are going through the work solutions for the D&D &D resources. So um, a thank you to D&D &D for allowing me to share their materials in this way. Um, hopefully you've got the uh, a copy of the book or the e-flip book that they provide and you can now follow along and see how I've worked through those questions. We're looking at differentiation, so for standard number 91578, and this is practice assessment number two. All right, question number one, we're going to differentiate the natural log of cosec x. Now for this, we are thinking chain rule. We have an outside function of natural log and an inside function of cosec x. So we differentiate the outside function, which is to do one over whatever was inside of that function. Um, that's what we do with differentiating the natural log. Now to differentiate the inside and multiply for chain rule. So if you take a look at your formula sheet, you will find that um, cosec x differentiates to negative cosec x cot x. Now, um, we can leave it there for the achieved point. Um, if you want to simplify, then the cosec cancels with the cosec, and we have negative cot x. For part B, we're working out a minimum, which means that we differentiate and set it equal to 0. So we have e to the half x. If we differentiate that, we get half e to the half x minus uh, 2x differentiates to negative 2 and 3 is a constant term that differentiates to 0. Now set that equal to 0. Um, so we would have e to the x over 2 equals 2 times 2. So x over 2 is equal to the natural log of 4 and x will be twice that. So x is 2.77. Now we're asked to find the minimum amount of money. Um, so the, we want the actual value of the money. We need to put it back into the m equation. So e to the 2.77 over 2 minus 2 times 2.77 plus 3. So e to the previous answer divided by 2 take away 2 times the answer and then add on 3. That is uh, 1.45. Now 1.45 doesn't make sense for amount of money so let's check. It's measured in hundreds of dollars. So this will be $145.48 if we want to get very specific about it. Now we've got one of my favourite types of questions um, for uh, part C. We have um, for which values of the limit, uh, or so sorry, for which values does a limit not exist on this graph over here? So limits are where we come towards a point from the left and the right, and the graph is aiming at the same point. So we can ignore little um, gaps in the graph like this one here at, at x equals minus five, because from the left and the right they're both coming towards that same point. So we're not interested at what happens exactly on that point, just what happens as you get close to it. That's what limits are about. And I'm just looking at the graph left to right. Same with this one. They're going towards the same point there. Where we do have things heading off in a different direction is just here at x equals 2. So we can't find a limit when x equals 2. Um, and then the other, the next one is this gap here, where from the left we're heading towards this point, but from the right we're heading towards that point. That's two different spots, so we don't have a limit when x equals 3. Okay, um, find the values of x that meet the following conditions. f of x is continuous but not differentiable. So we can't differentiate at points where we have sudden turns um, like kinks in our graph, so that would be just here. It is continuous, you could draw it without taking your pen off the page, uh, but we couldn't differentiate it at that point. 
Okay, part two, the gradient is equal to zero. We want anywhere that is a horizontal line or it's a minimum or maximum or turning point. So we, the obvious one we can see is just here. So that would happen at x equals five, but we also have one just here where the graph flattens out um, before it uh, carries on again. So that would be at zero and five. Um, and then the second derivative being greater than zero means we are part of a minimum. So any portion of the graph that could form part of that bowl shape uh, will create that second derivative being equal to zero. So we are just here on this portion right there. So that is um, between zero and two. Um, what is the value of f of minus five? Well, here's minus five. If we read up to our graph, we have a hole in the graph. So we actually don't have a value given at minus five. Okay, part D, we have this parabola. It's got a right angle triangle inscribed in the curve. Find the maximum area of the triangle. So to be able to maximize that area, we first need an expression for the area. Um, if we set um, this distance here to be x, then this distance here will be eight minus x. For area of a triangle, we need the height as well. This height is the equivalent of y, um, given that the triangle has a corner that sits on the y curve. So whatever x is, is going to be our height there. So this will be um, 8x minus x squared. So the, the x value that goes in just here um, gets put into the equation for y. So then area is half base times height. So that'll be half times the base of 8 minus x times the height, which is 8x minus x squared. Okay, let's multiply that through. Um, I'll deal with the half in a moment. I'm just going to expand the bracket first. So we get 64x minus 8x squared. Um, I'll pop that half in there. Um, where did I get to? So 8 times 8, 8x, 64. 8 times minus x squared gives me minus 8x squared. Then we have the middle term, another minus 8x squared. And then minus x times minus x squared is plus x cubed. Um, now, if we are doing um, a maximum area, we need to work out the derivative dA by dx. Oh, I should have multiplied through by that half first. We'll do that first. So let's go with half of 64 is 32x minus 4x squared minus another 4x squared. So pop them together. We've got minus 8x squared um, plus half x cubed. Now, if we differentiate that expression there, we've got 32 minus 16x plus 3 over 2x squared. Um, now, to find maximums and minimums, we'll set that equal to 0. I'm going to head over to Equation Solver just to save us a bit of time there. We've got F2 for polynomials. Uh, we've got a degree of 2 because we're doing a quadratic. The x squared term is 3 over 2, or 1.5. The x term is minus 16. And the constant is 32. We're going to solve that. So we have that x equals 2. Oh, 2 point, well, 2 and 2 thirds that will be. Or 8. Um, now, making the base 8 isn't going to work. That would be pushing it as far as wide as it possibly could be, and then it wouldn't make a triangle. So that one's not valid. So the max area when x is 2 and 2 thirds 
is what did we need to do there so the maximum area of the triangle so we'll do half base times height so that'll be half times two and two thirds times oh actually i'm just going to pop it into this bit up here so let's just put it straight into there and we can go um, two and two thirds enter it as an answer okay 32 answer minus 8 answer squared plus 0 0.5 answer cubed no let me just fix that up so 37.9 um, we don't have any units, we'll write it as units squared for area. Okay, the excellence. We need the values of A and B so that this thing has a point of inflection at um, when X is 12 and Y is a third. Now points of inflection happen when the second derivative is equal to zero, so we need to differentiate Y twice. So the first uh, thing we're going to do is the quotient rule. We've got something on the top, something on the bottom. Um, so we will do quotient rule. So quotient rule is we're going to do the bottom times the derivative of the top. So that's a x plus b squared minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. So if we differentiate the bottom, we've got chain rule happening. So it'll be 2. That gets reduced by 1. So we've got to the power of 1. Leave the inside as it was, and then times by the derivative of the inside. So if I tidy that up, we have 2ax, ax plus b. And it's all over v squared. So this will be ax plus b to the 4. Okay, now let's see if we can simplify some of this because we need to differentiate again. Um, I can cancel through by ax plus b. So I can take one off of there, one off of there, and one off of there. Um, and then we get ax plus b minus 2ax all over a x plus b cubed. Now we can spot that we have an ax and a minus 2ax. Uh, so we can put those together. So this would be ax minus 2ax. It's going to be b minus a single ax all over ax plus b cubed. OK, now the second derivative. We're going to take that function and differentiate it again. We've got quotient rule again. We have something on the top and we have something on the bottom. OK, so V du by dx, so AX plus B cubed times the derivative of the top, which is a negative A, minus U dV by dx, so the top times by the derivative of the bottom um, will be the th okay yeah three and then ax plus b squared and then times it by a so that becomes a minus three a just here all over the bottom squared which is ax plus b to the power of six Okay, now let's tidy this up. Um, we have a minus a, ax plus b cubed, minus 3a, minus ax plus b, ax plus b squared, all over ax plus b to the 6. Okay, now I can see that 
I have at least an AX plus B squared in all of those terms, so I can cancel two of these powers out. So that becomes a power of one just there. We have, um, let's multiply that through, so minus A squared X minus AB plus 3A squared X minus 3AB all over AX plus B to the 4. And then collecting like terms, we've got minus a squared x plus 3a squared x will give me 2a squared x. We have minus ab minus 3ab, so that's minus 4ab all over ax plus b to the power of 4. Okay, for a point of inflection. when the second derivative is equal to zero. So we set that equal to zero, we would bring that up and multiply it so we're actually only interested in the denominator being equal to, equal to zero. So we then use that to work out the value of x in terms of a and b. So x is 4ab over 2a squared, so that's 2b um, over a. Uh, now if y is 2b over a, oh, sorry, x is 2b over a, then y, let's go back to our expression, that's x over ax plus b squared. Uh, so that's going to be 2b over a um, all over a times x is going to be 2ab over a. So that becomes just 2b. Um, plus a b, so that's 3b, and then squared becomes 9b. No, it's 9b squared, because it was 3b all squared, so 9b squared. Okay, that's the same as timesing by 1 over 9b squared, and that would simplify to 2 over 9ab. Now we're nearly there. I am running out of room because I've taken up a lot of uh, writing space here. I'm going to need to go over to the side. Um, so we're going to use this bit of information in the question that this point of inflection happens at 12 and 1 third. So then um, just following along over here, if x is 2b over a, then that will be equal to 12. So 2b equals 12a, or b is equal to 6a. If y is equal to the value that we had was 1 third, uh, oh wait, let's write down that it, we had it in terms of a and b first. So that was 2 over 9ab and that's equal to a third. Sub in that um, 2 is 9a times 6a, replacing the b with the a, that's equal to a third. So we have 2 over 54a squared is equal to one third, or 54a squared is equal to 6. Okay, almost finished. Let's just get a little bit more room. So then um, a will be 6 divided by 54 and then square root our answer, which is one third. And if A is one third, B is six times one third, so B is two. Gosh, that took a long time to get through to the answer. Not too tricky to do, um, just quite a bit of it. Moving on to question two. 
I'm going to differentiate this one using the chain rule. So the four times two becomes eight. That reduces the power um, to three. The inside stays the same, and we multiply it by the derivative of the inside. That's 3x squared plus uh, 1, and you can leave it just like that. For part b, we want to find the gradient of the normal to the curve, so we'll need to be careful to do the negative reciprocal um, once we've got the gradient. So differentiating, uh, first of all, let's just make sure that's clear. That's a plus just there. So if we differentiate x squared, we get 2x. If we differentiate cos pi x, we're going to have the pi comes out um, as the derivative of the inside. Cos differentiates to minus sign. And then we have pi x inside. Uh, and we're doing that when x is equal to 1. So when x equals 1, dy by dx is then equal to 2 times 1 minus pi sine of pi times 1. Well, sine of pi is 0, um, so that ends up being 2. So then the gradient of the normal is the negative reciprocal of that, so that's minus a half. Part C, we've got a curve defined by parametric equations. We want to find dy by d theta so that we can show that it's equal to 2 sine theta. So for parametric equations, we need to differentiate x first. So x is 4 sec theta. So dx by d theta is um, 4 sec theta tan theta, that's on your formula sheet for what sec differentiates to. Now y is 8 tan theta, so dy by d theta. Again, check your formula sheet, tan goes to sec squared theta. Now we've got that, we can put them together for dy by dx. So we do dy by d theta times d theta by d, uh, dx which is 8 sec squared theta times 1 over 4 sec theta tan theta, because um, we needed to flip over the dx by d theta so that we get d theta by dx. Um, that sec will cancel with one of those. The um, 8 divided by the 4 cancels to a 2. So this is 2 over cos theta times tan is sine over cos, so if we do 1 over that we will have cos over sine. The coses cancel, so we end up with 2 over sine theta, just as we were asked for in the question. All right, part D. For what value of k does this function have a stationary point at x equals 1? Okay, for stationary points, we need the derivative to be equal to zero. So we need to differentiate this thing. Um, just going to rewrite it a little bit first. So this will be k 2x plus 1 to the minus 1 plus 4x. So this di differentiated, we get minus k, uh, reduce the power by 1, um, leave the inside as it was, times by the derivative of the inside, and then we have the plus 4. Let's rub that out of the way. So that's minus 2k over 2x plus 1 all squared plus 4, and we're setting that equal to 0, which means we have 2k over 2x plus 1 squared is equal to 4. Now, if we're checking this against um, x equals ooh, x equals one, um, then when x equals one, we would have two k over two plus one is three, and then square it is nine. 
So that's equal to 4. So k would have to be um, 4 times 9 divided by 2, 18. So if k is 18, that will give us a stationary point at x equals 1. OK, we're maximising the area of this triangle that we have here. So first of all, we need to get an expression for that area. Now, the base of our triangle is 2x. So we'll have half times 2x. And the height is 10 plus y. Uh, y we can work out in terms of x using this right angled triangle here. So uh, x squared plus y squared is 100. y is going to be equal to the square root of 100 minus x squared. So then we have this line here becomes x times 10 plus the square root of 100 minus x squared, which is 10x plus x 100 minus x squared to the power of a half. Now let's work out dA by dx by differentiating that. So 10x differentiates to 10. The second part, we need to use the product rule. We've got one piece here and the other piece there. Actually, I'm going to do that different color. Let's see if we can have that stand out a little easier. So this bit here. So if I differentiate x, I get 1 and then times it by the 100 minus x squared to the half. Add on x times the derivative of the blue bit, the second piece. So that's half 100 minus x squared, reduce the power by 1, and times by the derivative of the inside, which is minus 2x. Now tidying things up, let's see what we can do. So we've got 100 minus x squared to the half. Uh, we have an x, where's my cursor gone? Just trying to find it. Um, there we go. So we've got an x here times by a minus 2x there and then times by a half. So we'll end up with minus x squared. 100 minus x squared to the minus a half. Then to find a maximum, we would set that equal to zero. Um, if I bring this term over here over to the left-hand side, we would have x squared. Uh, I'm going to actually turn this into a, over the root of 100 minus x squared. It's equal to 10 plus the square root of 100 minus x squared. Mm, not too helpful just yet, but let's multiply everything through by this 100 minus x squared square rooted, which would leave us with x squared on the left, 10 times the square root of 100 minus x squared plus 100 minus x squared. Then I'm going to take, um, I've lost my mouse again, one minute, uh, these terms here over to the left. So we will have 2x squared minus 100 equals 10 root 100 minus x squared. Okay, now let's square both sides. So if we do this one squared and this one squared, we'll end up with 4x to the 4 minus 100 times 2 is 200x squared and there'll be two lots of that so it'd be minus 400x squared plus 10,000. 
will be equal to 100 times 100 minus x squared, or 10,000 minus 100 x squared. Now the 10,000 will cancel with the 10,000 like this. If we bring the minus 100 x squared over to the left hand side, we will have 4x to the 4 uh, minus 300 x squared is equal to 0. You can take out um, a 4x squared. We'll have x squared minus um, 300 divided by 4 is 75. So either x equals 0, which doesn't make sense in this context, so we can ignore that one, or x squared equals 75. So x has to be a positive number because it's a measurement. So we're going to do the square root of 75. And that's 8.66 centimeters. Now, back to the question. Let's check what we actually have to need to, what we actually have to work out. What are the dimensions of the triangle so it has the largest possible area? So we need the base and the height. So therefore, the base was equal to 2 times x, so that's 17.32 centimetres, and the height was equal to, where did we have that? Um, it's this much just here, plus 10. So we have 100 minus 8.66 squared, find the square root of that, and then add on 10. There we go. Uh, it didn't ask us to work out the area itself, just what's the dimensions of the triangle so that it does have the largest possible area. All right, let's go to question three. We're going to differentiate here and we have a product rule. We've got the first piece of our product rule there and the second piece just here. So dy by dx, differentiate the first thing it's two times by the second thing, plus leave the first thing as it is and differentiate the second thing or cos, um, differentiates to minus sign and then it will be multiplied by the derivative inside and that derivative of x squared is 2x. Um, for achieved you can leave it like that but if you want to tidy it up it will look like this um, minus 4x squared sine of x squared. Part B, we've got the height of a sunflower in centimetres after t days growth. We've got an equation. What's the rate of change of the height um, after 10 days? So dh by dt. Well, 140 is a constant. That differentiates away to zero. But we have um, over here. We have e, now e itself doesn't change, so that's e to the minus 0.04t, but we multiply what's in front of it by the derivative of what's inside, so that's negative 140 times by negative 0.04, and that's 5.6. Now when t is 10, for the 10 days here, dh, by dt will be 5.6 e to the minus 0 0.04 times 10. So 5.6 e to the negative 0 0.04 times 10. We get 3.75 centimeters. Part C, we've got tangent to the curve um, and um, 
those two tangents that are drawn onto here are perpendicular. So we have them crossing at a right angle. So if we're doing tangents, we know we are going to need the gradient. So that's 4x minus 1 over x. Now at A, where um, we've got that first coordinate, we have um, when x equals 1, we'll have a gradient of, we'll pop it, that into the calculator, 4 times 1, oh, we don't need the calculator for this really, minus 1 over 1 is going to be 3. So the gradient um, of the perpendicular to that is negative 1 over 3. So now we're taking the gradient here. We want to set it equal to negative 1 over 3 to see when uh, x would give us that answer. And that will tell us that we're on the line where b is. We're, we're on this line here. Um, if the gradient is equal to negative one third. So let's start by multiplying through by three. We'll have 12x minus one, uh, three over x equals minus one. Let's also multiply through by x. We would have 12x squared. This is three, this is minus x. So 12x squared plus x minus three equals zero. And I can't see a quick factorizing of that, so let's go to equation solver. Um, oh, I meant to do polynomials. We have degree two, a 12, a one, and a negative three. And solve it. So x is either, looking at the calculator, we've got two solutions here. It's 0 0.46 or it's minus 0.543. For B, it's got to be the positive one because it's on the positive side of the axis. So it's 0 0.46 at B. Then if X is equal to 0 0.46, Y equals two times 0 0.46 squared minus log of 0 0.46. So now we need to show that that is going to come out to what we want. Log 0 0.46. So B is 0 0.46, 1.2, which matches what we had in the question. Okay, on to D. Okay, so uh, y is cos 2x and we want to work out what this is when x is pi by 4. So first we will need to work out dy by dx. Uh, cos differentiates to negative sign. And the 2x gives us a 2 that pops out for the chain rule. We also need the second derivative. So differentiating that again, sine goes to positive cos. And the minus 2 gets multiplied by the 2 that was inside, so that's a 4. Okay, when x is pi by 4, then this function, dy by dx over the square root of 1 plus d2y dx squared, will be equal to uh, negative 2 sine of 2 times pi by 4 all over the square root of 1 plus negative 4 cos of 2 times pi by 4 um, like that. Yes, that's everything. OK, so let's pop that in. Uh, 2 times pi by 4 is pi by 2. So I'm just going to pop that into the calculator just to make things a little easier. We're going to do negative 2 sine of 
that answer divided by the square root of one, let's get some brackets in there, uh, one minus four cos of that value that we just had. Ooh, that came out to a nice round number. That comes to minus two. Okay, the last excellence question that we've got here, we're talking about um, a rate of change. Uh, we've got the plane speed is 840 kilometers per hour, and we want to know the how fast the angle theta is changing. So let's write down those two bits of information. Uh, we've been told the speed, so it's how far it's moving over time. Now, x is the measure of how far it has moved. Um, so that's this 840. So the rate at which x is changing over time is 840. The rate that we want to find out is the rate at which the angle is changing over time. If we were to start with the rate that we know, we would have to introduce theta and divide by the x. So we'd end up with dx by d theta. So we need something that links x and theta. So we're looking over at oh, the triangle here to link the x and the theta. And we know the opposite of that triangle. So we're going to use the opposite and adjacent, which means tan theta is equal to 7 over x. Now we can't differentiate inverse tan, so let's do things in terms of x's rather than thetas. So x would be um, 7 times tan theta to the minus 1. which is in fact 7 cot theta. Um, and the reason I've switched it to cot because we do have the derivative for cot on our formula sheet. So dx by d theta is equal to, cot goes to negative cosec, so it's negative 7 cosec squared x, sorry, cot goes to negative cosec squared x. So back to here, dx by dt is 840 times by d theta by dx, um, so that's times by minus 7, oh, no, it's 1 over minus 7 cosec squared theta. So we need theta for the time that we want to work this out for. Now the time that we're doing it is, ah, oh, there it is, 10 minutes. The speed at which it was traveling was 840 kilometers per hour. So at 10 minutes, if it can travel 840 kilometers in an hour in 10 minutes, we would divide that by 6. We would have x equals 140. Tan theta is 7 over 140. So 7 divided by 140 and then inverse tan of that we get that theta is equal to 0 0.05. So then back to working out d theta by dt 840 times 1 over minus 7 cosec squared of 0 0.05. Okay, back over to the calculator. Let's work that out. Now, cosec is 1 over sine, so I need to do sine of that answer. I'm going to square it, do 1 divided by it, um, times it by negative 7, 1 divided by that answer, times it by 840. And that comes to minus 0 0.3. And the measurements we've got, the angle is in radians and the time was in hours. There we go, all done.